All right. Hey, thanks everybody for uh, joining us on the our quarterly Sierra Club Arctic campaign update. And this is the second year of these updates, so I'm really excited that you all are joining us and that we're able to have these calls and get you all connected with what's happening with the campaign and the Arctic. And it's super important because as we've talked about on these other calls, um, it's really the people like you, people all across the country who have kept oil and gas development out of the most special places in Alaska. And it's really the great work that you've done um, is the reason that we have this these places protected. And it's the work you're doing that's keeping them protected. So today is really um, an auspicious day. It's the 25th anniversary of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And we have a very special guest with us tonight to talk about the oil spill and its lingering impacts and how that connects with uh, the potential for oil development in Alaska today. So we'll hear from, from Rick in a minute and then after Rick we have, um, we'll do some updates with the Arctic campaign and then I have some questions that folks have sent in so I'll answer some of those questions and then we will um, wrap up the call. So um, for me, I've been working on Alaska conservation issues for just a little over two decades. So I, I came to the state not too long after the Exxon Valdez oil spill and it was still very much um, front and center in people's minds. And in the entire time that I have been there, um, our guest uh, Rick Steiner has really been on the forefront of efforts to um, educate people about the terrible impacts from the Exxon Valdez oil spill and to really make change um, with our laws and regulations that govern the transportation and the drilling of oil. So it's a really um, honor for me to have Rick join us tonight to give us all a, um, an education on, on what the oil spill is like, what um, has transpired in those 25 years, and to start to take a look forward of what we need to do to, to work to protect Alaska's most special places. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to um, Rick Steiner. Hi folks, uh, and <clears throat> thanks Dan and, and everybody for joining us here. And I, I guess I was asked to talk for 10 or 15 minutes or so and and then be available to answer questions and I'd, I'd enjoy that part. Um, 25 years ago today, uh, the Exxon Valdez slammed full speed into Bly Reef, a well-marked reef in Prince William Sound. It was the accident that we all knew could happen but we're all promised would never happen. We were promised back when they decided to build the pipeline across Alaska that they would have the best oil spill prevention and response system in the world and obviously that simply didn't happen. Um, the Exxon Valdez spilled probably 20 million gallons or more of very toxic Alaska North Slope crude oil right at the time of the biological spring in Prince William Sound. And, and let me assure you that, and I'd lived in the Sound for many years before that and during, and it was one of the most spectacular coastal environments anywhere. And I know you all have your own special coastal or, or onshore environment, and uh, you need to do everything you can to protect them from this sort of thing. The oil spread over about 10,000 square miles of Alaska's coastal ocean ended up boiling about 1,300 miles of some of the most pristine shoreline in the world. Uh, it killed millions of seabirds, marine mammals, fish, and vertebrates just in that first summer alone. And here we are 25 years later, a quarter of a century later, it's almost hard to believe, um, but unfortunately the ecological injury persists to this day. There's still thousands of gallons of Exxon Valdez oil in our beach sediments. It's still relatively unweathered, still very toxic, and still affecting the nearshore ecosystem. Most of the monitored fish and wildlife populations and habitats that the government has monitored have not fully recovered. Some are not recovering at all 25 years later, and those include Pacific herring, pigeon guillemots, a small seabird, and one very unique pod of killer whales, the AT1 killer whale pod, which went to, from 22 animals prior to the spill down to seven animals today. 
and because they have not had a calf since the spill in the last 25 years, the last calf they had was just before the spill, um, the governments expect there to be no hope for recovery. That's their words, not mine, for this distinct killer whale pod. So not only have we learned that there's long-term injury from oil spills possible, but there can be permanent ecological harm from oil spills. The human communities that were reliant on Prince William Sound and the North Gulf Coast, primarily the com commercial fishing community and Alaska Native community, were thrown into chaos and turmoil from this and to some extent have recovered, to some extent have not and will never. They felt they got a very poor resolution at trial against Exxon. They had won a $5 billion punitive verdict against Exxon back in the early 90s, and Exxon does what Exxon does, and they appealed it every step of the way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and a few years ago, the Supreme Court whittled down the $5 billion punitive verdict to only $500 million, a tenth of what the jury had awarded. So a lot of these people felt really betrayed by the justice system. The government case, litigation against Exxon, was partially resolved in 1991 for a billion dollars for restoration. There was a clause in that allowing the governments to present a claim and in, in, in the future for damages that we didn't know about at the time. They did present that claim to Exxon in 1990, I'm sorry, in 2006. It was for $92 million in additional monies to deal with this lingering oil, toxic oil issue in the beaches. And although Exxon had agreed to pay this in the 1991 settlement, they did, again, what Exxon does, and they refused, and they have refused ever since. And here we are seven years later, and the governments have yet to drag Exxon into court seeking to compel Exxon to honor its commitment to pay this reopener claim. So the Exxon Valdez now is the longest-lasting environmental litigation in world history. And that is not something to be proud of. It just shows that the laws and the judicial system are set up basically to favor big, big polluters rather than we the people, the injured victims, and the environment. And that is something you could expect from any major spill uh, in the Arctic or in Bristol Bay or in Puget Sound or wherever you happen to be. Um, we've got a lot of several take-home messages. I'll wrap this up here pretty quickly so we can get to your questions, which should be more fun than listening to myself talk. Um, one is that once you've spilled oil, it's pretty much game over. You cannot clean it up. Uh, it can cause long-term, even permanent environmental damage, and you cannot restore a spill-injured marine or coastal ecosystem. They are learning that now in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and everywhere where there's been major marine oil spills, we have learned these lessons. So the three preeminent uh, take-home messages from my standpoint are, number one, we have got to stay out, keep oil drilling and oil transportation out of these precious coastal areas that we do not want to accept the consequences of a catastrophic spill. Uh, because no matter how, <laughs> how safe we can make a system, there's always risk period. Number two, where we as a society opt to continue doing oil and gas development, it has to be done with the highest possible safety standards, regardless of cost. And that's something both industry and government have been unwilling to, to go to so far. They keep saying they're doing it responsibly, but they're not willing to put in that additional everything that needs to be done can be done regardless of cost standard. So that's of concern. Um, and thirdly, and this is something I know all of you probably feel strongly about as well, we have got to get serious about urgently transitioning from hydrocarbons, dirty energy, to clean, sustainable, low carbon uh, energy economy in this country. The main point about oil spills to a number of us is that oil spills per se are not the main point oil use is. And at the time of Exxon Valdez, many of us were calling for a transition to sustainable, low-carbon energy. Yet since Exxon Valdez, the world has used twice as much oil, 700 billion barrels, as in all of human history up until that date. And that is scandalous, in my view. Atmospheric CO2 levels were at 350 parts per million 
at the time of Exxon Valdez. Now they're at 400 parts per million. We've lost half of this Arctic sea ice cap in the last 25 years. And so, you know, there's just simply a number of indicators showing us that our thirst for hydrocarbons is almost endless. Government policy hasn't kept step with what we the people are demanding, so we need to be more uh, vocal, I think, about that. So we need, where we're due oil and gas, we need to do it more safely with highest best available technology standards. We need to keep it out of these areas where we do not wish to accept the consequences of a catastrophic spill, and we need to use oil more efficiently and wind it down because of its, uh, its carbon footprint and because just drilling for it, exploring for it, uh, producing it, transporting it, causes enormous environmental and social harm. So I think, you know, I could talk for hours. I don't think you want to hear that, but let's go to some questions and, and uh, have a conversation. Great. Well, thanks, Rick. And uh, the way this is set up is I um, will be asking the questions that people have uh, sent in. And so thanks again for, for that. And both Rick and I are back here in, in Washington, D.C. this week. Um, um, meeting with folks on the Hill and with people in the administration talking about the importance of, just as Rick said, keeping um, keeping that oil in the ground and moving us to a clean energy um, economy. So some questions we got. Um, one comes from a Charles Rupley, and it asks about the endangered, the species that were harmed, um, and you touched on that. But he, his question is, is there hope for you to, uh, the species other than the orcas, are there hope for those other species to eventually recover? We hope so. That's a good question and, and, no, and the honest answer is nobody knows for sure. Uh, the recovery standard that the state and federal trustee council has imposed is that a population has to be, has to have returned to where it would have been absent the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So not just for it to return to where its pre-spill population numbers were, but here 25 years later, if the population was expanding, then one would have to model and understand or estimate where it would have been today absent the oil spill. And in many cases, that's a much larger population than what uh, the pre-spill population was. A good example is sea otters. There was a lot of news about two or three weeks ago, uh, a lot of misinterpretation of a USGS study saying that they thought sea otters had recovered. Well, number one, they did not have the authority to make a recovery declaration, nor did they. They just simply said otters were back to their pre-spill numbers, and there was still uncertainty about the genetic information, whether they were still being exposed to oil. Sea otter, the only one, only government group that will make a determination of when something is recovered is the state and federal trustee council and they have not changed their recovery status declarations since May of 2010 so sea otters are still listed as recovering most fish and wildlife populations and habitats are still listed as recovering or not recovered um, and those three are still not recovering at all so you know one we have to hope uh, one thing I'm, I will add here is that we had this sort of an unfounded uh, expectation of the resiliency of marine ecosystems prior to Exxon Valdez, and some people still cling to that. What I see after Exxon Valdez is the lack of resiliency, the, the sensitivity to major disturbances like dumping 40 or 50,000 tons of a toxic hydrocarbon fluid into the into a coastal ecosystem right at the biological spring. So I take from this that marine ecosystems and coastal systems are much more vulnerable to these sorts of disturbances. Great, and I think this, this next question sort of touches on that same vein, but I, I think it's a good one. You, you talked about the oil still lingering, and, and I've been out there on the beaches and been able to dig down and see the layer of, of oil. Is there any hope that that um, oil can, will be, well, is it there forever, I guess is the question. Uh, yeah, I, that is a good question, <laughs> and effectively, probably. Um, you know, you could, we'd go out into Prince William Sound, you could still see splatters of the fuel oil that was spilled 50 years ago during the Great Alaska Earthquake, the 1964 earthquake. Uh, this is a cold, you know, for six months of the year it's very cold and so bacterial degradation doesn't work hardly at all. Um, 
the oil that's there right now, there's anywhere in, anywhere between 10 to 60,000 gallons still in the beach sediments. Uh, the government's own report says that this will be there for decades, if not centuries. Their own words, not mine. Uh, and there is a, this reopener for unknown injury that I mentioned earlier, the government's ongoing litigation with Exxon, what they, what they asked for, demanded $92 million for in 2006, was to try to go out and remediate some of the subsurface lingering oil by ejecting oxygen compounds and nutrients to try to simply enhance the biodegradation, the natural bioremediation of the oil. Yet, here they are seven years later, they're at least six years behind their, their proposed schedule. They're claim, claiming, you know, there's contracted issues and it's a difficult working environment. And what we get are sort of these, the cat ate my homework excuses year after year after year. And I cannot imagine a government letting you or I off of a $92 parking ticket. Much and here they're letting Exxon skate entirely from a $92 million demand for payment from 2006. But that if they ever do collect that, um, that would be used to fund their subsurface lingering oil remediation program. Right. And then one one last question on the Exxon Valdez, and then we'll we'll move yeah. into the Arctic update. The question here is from Douglas Mason, and it he asks about the evidence of a fisheries collapse in the Gulf of Mexico. And I know that you have worked with folks down there and 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 thought about that as well. So can you talk about um, if there's comparable losses in the Gulf um, to what happened in Prince William Sound? Well, one thing for sure is that it's still early days in the Gulf, even though we're four years into that disaster. Um, but certainly there were major fisheries impacts. There were really major impacts to dolphins, sea turtles, deepwater coral communities, and coastal habitat. I think you'll, you're, I am predicting that there may be permanent impact to the dolphin pods in the Gulf. Uh, we watch them inhaling the oil vapors in Barataria Bay and, and some of these areas where, where they concentrate to feed on right where the oil was coming into the bays and uh, they were ingesting this stuff that was getting in their eyes. There's been massive dolphin mortality there so my guess is if there's enough known about the, the social structure of these dolphin uh, groups to be able to track that over the next 10, 20, 30 years we'll see possibly the same sort of injury that we saw in the AT1 killer wells in Prince William Sound. Um, I think there will, there will certainly be long-term environmental injury in the Gulf. Whether it will be permanent or not, I don't know, but I'm guessing it probably will be. So, you know, that should dispel any myth from the oil industry or the government that oil spills are a transient phenomenon, they're short-term acute injury, but they, they move on and things recover very quickly and we know now that that is not the case. Great. Well, thanks, thanks Rick. And um, I think you'll be on and maybe there'll be some other, uh, you can chime in at some other part um, later in the call. But I wanted to move on now sure. and, and give an update on the um, Arctic campaign and where we are with that. Um, and I think kind of two things that, that I wanted to highlight and one is a sort of a recent victory that we've had in the Arctic and two is the need to really um, double down now and to take action to, to talk to the Obama administration and convince them to not have a new leasing or new development in the Arctic Ocean. And the first then is the um, a court case that was recently decided around the lease sales in the Chukchi Sea and these lease sales date all the way back to the Bush administration and they have been working their way this case through the court system for all of these years and just a few weeks ago we had a, a great victory where the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals found that the government had erred in their process of leasing these sales and had not taken into account enough of the potential environmental impacts and so that decision has really opened a window for us to to talk to the um, Obama administration and the agencies that that manage this area to really say that now is the time to to take a look at this that we shouldn't be drilling in the Arctic Ocean and we should not be offering these areas up for leasing and we all know that Shell Oil has been the 
the company that has been pushing hardest to get into the Arctic. And I think what they proved two summers ago was that, that no company is really ready to be drilling or exploring in this, this harsh environment. And Shell's efforts in, in 2012, well, I'll remember, were, were just fraught with, with accidents and mistakes, and they um, faced millions of dollars in fines from their pollution. During that summer, they had to um, move off of their drilling areas because big, giant icebergs floated through. And then ultimately, one of their drill um, ships broke loose while it was being towed. Um, back to a winter port and grounded on an island in uh, south central Alaska on Kodiak Island. And so that, that essentially put that ship completely out of commission and, and changed Shell's plans then. So we have Shell proving that they can't drill safely in this environment. And we have the courts saying that the government um, needs to relook at the, the environmental, potential environmental impacts from this development. So we are asking folks to weigh in with the administration and to say they really need to take a close look at the current leases, um, reevaluate um, the potential impacts, and not allow drilling on the current leases, and then ultimately not offer any new um, oil and gas leases in the Arctic Ocean. And all of you on this call who are part of the Sierra Club's Arctic team have had emails from us recently with the opportunity to take that action and to send a message to the Obama administration. And I just encourage you to do that. In addition, um, with the email to sign up for this, um, this video chat, you uh, had the opportunity to ask for uh, letters to the editor. And again, around this Exxon Valdez anniversary is a really excellent time to uh, to submit one of these letters to your local newspaper. Um, you know, the, the press is very interested in this 25th anniversary, and we've seen a lot of, of response to these LTEs. And so it's really important to get that um, in there. It helps spread the word. It gets more people um, excited and energized to help to protect America's Arctic Ocean. So that's the, the kind of quick update on the Arctic Ocean side. I just wanted to do two more um, Arctic updates, and then there's some really great questions here that I, I think we'll, we'll take some time and answer those. Um, on the Arctic refuge front, so the, the Fish and Wildlife Service's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, there's some interesting developments there. The, um, the Obama administration and the Department of Interior and the Fish and Wildlife Service has been great on the Arctic refuge issue. They've really stood up and said that this is a special place where there shouldn't be oil and gas um, exploration and development. That hasn't been good enough for the state of Alaska, um, which has been pushing to have that opened up for some special, um, for some seismic exploration, which is really damaging to the, the tundra and the environment. And they recently um, applied for a permit to do this seismic exploration, and the Department of Interior and Secretary Jewell told them no, they would not allow that, um, and it, it's not allowable under the law. And the state of Alaska recently sued the federal government to be allowed to go into the Arctic refuge. Um, so I find it kind of ironic that the state of Alaska, which talks about frivolous lawsuits all the time, um, <laughs> has filed another lawsuit that they're they're destined to lose, but it, it just shows that they'll go to any any lengths to, to push open these special places in America's Arctic. So that's something that the, the coalition of, of groups that work on the Arctic Refuge is following and taking great steps to uh, you know to make sure that this this state um, push is seen as the the silly idea that it is. And then the other issue that's happening is in the Western Arctic. Um, and there is a the Bureau of Land Management is taking comments right now on a proposal from ConocoPhillips, another oil company, to develop a oil field on the very edge of the National Petroleum Reserve in the Western Arctic. And there's comments there. And again, the the environmental community, the coalition of groups that work on this, we are working to um, send in comments and to to push the BLM to make sure that they offer a broad enough suite of alternatives that has a true environmental alternative that would, that would safeguard these precious landscapes and the wildlife and, and other resources that are found there. 
So that's something else that through our, our web page in the coalition you can find out more information. And if you have specific questions, I think you can you can feel free to email me, um, Dan Ritzman at sierraclub.org on on these issues. So I think we'll we'll wrap up um, and just take a few of the questions um, here. Let me go through these. One one of the first ones from Diane um, was, can the United Nations intervene as they did in Antarctica to make sure all nations understand um, that the Arctic is important and that it needs to be protected? And that is a really great question. Antarctica um, was was sort of set aside by by a coalition of, of governments and, and protected. Um, it's a, it was a unique place because it was a, a continent that didn't have um, people living on it, where in the Arctic it's, it's ocean with uh, continents of people living on it surrounding it. So it, it's a much heavier lift, I think, to look for an international solution to the Arctic, but there's really great campaigns happening in all of the um, all of the countries, and so we would uh, we'd really um, like to see the United States be a leader in these efforts. Um, so that's that's really one of the big pushes for our coalition efforts here is to see the Obama administration step up and really be a leader in these efforts to protect the Arctic. Um, and then a very difficult question: What do we do to reverse global warming? And I think Rick touched on that. I mean, it's really a need to, um, we need to move the country off of the burning of fossil fuels. We need to develop a transportation systems and systems that power our homes um, that, that don't rely on fossil fuels, that really tap into other alternative energy sources. And, you know, we're, we're taking, the administ current administration is taking really great steps in that direction. We're putting, um, we're putting, limits on the pollution from coal-fired power plants. We're really moving towards more renewable energy sources. They are putting strong limits on the pollution from our automobiles and transportation systems with fuel standards. Um, but that, that's half of the equation. That's, that's keeping limiting the pollution from the burning of fossil fuels. And the other half of that equation is really beginning to work to keep those dirty fossil fuels in the ground. And so in, especially in these places like the Arctic Ocean, we need to be keeping those fossil fuels in the ground, not um, tapping into them and burning them. Uh, let's see, so many questions. Well, we had a question about what spills have there been recently in the Arctic, and luckily, because um, there isn't drilling in the Arctic Ocean. These spills have been on land, but there have been a number of big spills. Um, two or three winters ago, BP had a major oil spill from a cracked pipe um, that spilled hundreds of thousands of, of gallons of oil. Um, and the, the reports that the oil companies file with the Alaska um, Department of Environmental Quality, the sort of agency that keeps track of these things in Alaska, it shows that there's a, more than a spill a day in the oil fields of Prudhoe Bay, and those are oil spills or spills of drilling fluids or other other kind of toxic chemicals. And they can they range obviously in size; they're not all major oil spills. But it just shows that you can't have this kind of level of industrial activity without um, spilling. Drilling equals spilling. So that's the if you're going to move that into the Arctic Ocean, um, you know that there's going to be inevitably oil spills there. Um, I'll do one last question. Um, it says, how should in individual Sierra Club members work with their members of Congress to put more federal protections against oil spills in place? And I think, I mean, I, I think one of the things we just like to, to really um, focus on on these calls is, is just the power that you all have with your members of Congress. I've always said that if I wasn't an environmental activist, I'd want to go back and be a civics teacher and just tell those kids in high school that really, you know, voting does matter and, and the people in office and who puts them there is really important. And, uh, you know, I think it's easy to become sort of cynical and look at look at the way um, Congress is and think about the influence that money has in this place. But my experience in, in 
two decades of doing this kind of work is that people really do matter and weighing in and letting Congress know and letting your elected officials know how you feel about these issues is the most important thing that you can do. And so I think on that note we will wrap up um, this edition of the uh, Sierra Club's Arctic Campaign um, conference call and I'll thank you all again for, for joining us and I look forward to our, our next one in the next quarter. So thanks. Thanks, folks.